we can probably. Are they ready? OK, so welcome, uh, everyone. It's a great pleasure to have you. Some people may arrive a little later because it's cold outside. There is a lot of traffic. Um, so let me uh, say a few words about uh, my uh, partner for this evening, um, Benjamin uh, Cohen. Um, he is the news director of The Forward, uh, America's uh, oldest Jewish newspaper. Uh, the newspaper began in 1897, and it has covered everything from the sinking of the Titanic <laughs> to the current war uh, in Israel. Uh, not surprisingly, it also published several interviews with Albert Einstein. Yeah. Um, Benjamin has a bizarre side job managing the official social media accounts of Albert Einstein, where he posts every day to the 20 million fans who follow the world's favorite genius across Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And he's here tonight to talk about his new book, The Einstein Effect, how the world's favorite genius got into our cars, our bathrooms, and our minds. His first book was called My Jesus Year. A rabbi's son wanders the Bible belt in search of his own faith. Uh, a memoir about Benjamin spending 52 weeks going to 52 different churches and how the experience made him a better Jew. Uh, for writing it, he received the Georgia Author of the Year Award and it was named one of the best books of the year by Publishers Weekly. Um, Benjamin uh, is based in, in uh, Morgantown, West Virginia, where he lives with his wife, three dogs, a cat, and a flock of chicken known as the Cohens. <laughs> <laughs> Cohen. And we, we have a chicken that uh, has a big white pompadour of hair. We call that chicken Albert Einstein, actually. Uh, all right, so I'm going to introduce Avi. Probably needs no introduction, but I'll introduce him anyway. Uh, Avi Loeb is the Frank Baird Professor of Science at Harvard University, best-selling author, and he received a PhD in physics from Hebrew University, a school that Einstein co-founded uh, and left his estate to. Uh, he led the first international project supported by the Strategic Defense Initiative and was subsequently a long-term member of the Institute for Advanced Study following Albert Einstein. That's where he spent most of his uh, career. Loeb has written nine books, seven more than me, uh, <laughs> including most recently Extraterrestrial and Interstellar, which is available for sale afterwards, uh, as well as over a thousand scientific papers. For someone who's not a professional writer, he writes a lot on a wide range of topics, including black holes, the search for extraterrestrial life, and the future of the universe. Dr. Loeb is the director of the Institute for Theory and Computation within the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, and also serves as the head of the Galileo Project, and he was the longest serving chair of Harvard's astronomy department, Department of Astronomy, and the founding director of Harvard's Black Hole Initiative. Uh, he's a former member of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology at the White House, a former chair of the Board of Physics and Astronomy of the National Academies, and a current member, relevant to tonight, of the advisory board for Einstein Visualize the Impossible at the Hebrew University. He also chairs the advisory committee for the Breakthrough Starshot Initiative and serves as the science theory director for all initiatives of the Breakthrough Prize Foundation. In 2012, Time Magazine selected Loeb as one of the 25 most influential people in space, and in 2020, Loeb was selected among the 14 most inspiring Israelis of the last decade. Netflix is making a documentary about him, and um, there is an entire chapter in The Einstein Effect dedicated to Avi Loeb's uh, research. And speaking of your research, before we start talking about Einstein, can you give us a little update on your latest research? I would be delighted. Uh, in fact, we should have saved some time. You could have introduced me as a curious farm boy. <laughs> I was born on a farm, and I'm still, I, I visited actually the elementary school where I studied as a kid. And I told the kids, um, you know, I'm just like you. I'm, I, I, when I don't know something, I'm curious and I'm trying to learn more about it. And 
I don't pretend to know something that I don't know, like the adults in the room. So one of the kids looked at me and said, but you are 61 years old, how can you be a kid? And I said, well, a beginner's mind is not a matter of biological age. Yeah. Um, so let me, um, in that context, um, say a few words about the latest update on an expedition uh, that we took to the Pacific Ocean this last uh, summer, and um, some of the results are of the past week or so. Um, so uh, if we can uh, dim the lights, uh, should I press a button here? Uh, which one? There we go. Okay. Um, so my fascination with objects from outside the solar system uh, started in 2017 when uh, the first object was reported by astronomers and it was moving too fast to be bound to the sun. Uh, roughly the size of a football field was given the name Oumuamua because it was discovered by a telescope in Hawaii and this name means a scout. Um, and uh, it was quite unusual uh, because it had a flat shape based on the reflection of sunlight from it and it changed the amount of sunlight reflected from it by a factor of 10 as it was tumbling every eight hours. And moreover, it was pushed away from the sun by some mysterious force and it didn't show any cometary evaporation. So it wasn't clear what is pushing it. It was not the rocket effect, the way, rock, the way comets are being pushed. And um, to me, it indicated that it's different from the rocks that we are familiar with in the solar system, so it's just like finding a tennis ball in your backyard among the rocks that you're aware of. And it's exciting to, to explore the possibility that it may not be a rock, actually. And then, um, um, oh, okay. So um, an interesting possibility, I mean, we all know about Elon Musk uh, that uh, decided uh, to put a dummy payload uh, on um, the Falcon Heavy launch a few years ago, and uh, he put his Tesla uh, road t Roadster on it. Uh, and this, is, this object, this Tesla, is now on an elliptic orbit around the, the sun, and it, it goes out to 1.67 times the Earth-Sun separation. And uh, just imagine that he's not the only entrepreneur since the Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago, that there were others on other planets, near other stars that formed billions of years before the sun. Most stars formed before the sun. And uh, therefore, you might find space trash. Now, Elon Musk himself just recently argued that, well, we might be alone and we should go to Mars because we have a responsibility to survive, uh, to, to maintain our long-term survival. Uh, but how does he know that we are alone? We need to search. Maybe there is space trash in our vicinity. Maybe Oumuamua was space trash. So uh, it takes less than a billion years for rockets of the type that we launched to cross the Milky Way galaxy from one side to the other. Less than a billion years with the spacecraft that we launched. We launched five of them to outer space, uh, Voyager 1, Voyager 2, Pioneer 10, Pioneer 11, New Horizons. So why not search if others send something that arrived to our backyard? And my fundamental point is that new scientific knowledge does not fall into our lap. You know, we had, uh, and when people say extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, they often, you know, they are not seeking the evidence. It's a circular argument. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you don't search, you will not find anything, and you will be justified in maintaining our ignorance. My point is extraordinary evidence requires extraordinary funding. OK, you need to put a lot of effort, because we had to invest you know, to find the Higgs boson. You know, without investing $10 billion, we won't do that in tw uh, 2012. Uh, to find the first stars and galaxies, a subject I worked on, we had to invest $10 billion in the Webb telescope. You know, we wouldn't see it with our naked eye, but even if you go back um, four centuries, 
you know, people thought that we are at the center of the universe and Galileo Galilei developed a telescope that is sensitive enough to see the moons of Jupiter. So that was required. You couldn't have said back then, I don't see any evidence, therefore we are at the center of the universe. You had to develop, to invest time and effort and find the evidence. So there is this new frontier of finding objects that came from outside the solar system, interstellar objects. And uh, uh, there were three of them that uh, were so far documented. The first one, a decade ago, exactly a decade ago, it was a meteor roughly the size of a watermelon that collided with Earth, an object that came from outside the solar system because it was moving extremely fast, faster than 95% of the stars in the vicinity of the sun. The second one was Oumuamua, and both this meteor and Oumuamua looked different. The meteor was tougher than all the space rocks that collided with Earth, 272 of them over the past uh, decade or so, documented by NASA. And the third object that was discovered was just an usual comet, a normal comet that we are familiar with. So out of the three, the first two looked unusual. To me, that's inspiring. It means we should study them more. And so we decided to go after the materials left over from the first interstellar meteor. Okay, so we went, the, the US government satellite uh, discovered the fireball the, that was created as a result of the friction of this object with air um, when it exploded about, about 20 kilometers above the Pacific Ocean of order 90 kilometers away from Papua New Guinea. So we went there to the Pacific Ocean because the US government confirmed the inference that uh, we made uh, with my student Amir Siraj that this is an interstellar object. So the US Space Command wrote a letter to NASA saying yes, at the 99.999% confidence this object came from, outer, from outside the solar system. They also released the data on the explosion, the, the fireball, the light curve of the fireball, which indicated that the object was tougher than all space rocks because it was able to sustain its integrity uh, to very high stress. So then we went there. And uh, let me show you some pictures. So this uh, set of pictures was on Silver Star, uh, the ship that we rented. And uh, that's the team of 28 people that I assembled. Um, uh, and they included the best navigators, the best engineers in the world for uh, ocean expeditions. And amazingly, we found material by using a sled with magnets on both sides. Uh, from the meteor site. Here you see the Netflix team uh, filming me. Uh, every morning I jog at sunrise and I maintain this habit also on the ship. And one morning they said, let's, uh, let's take a picture of you. And they even used the drone and they asked me to run three times longer than I usually do. <laughs> <laughs> so it was about uh, 10 miles that morning. Um, and this is the sled. We scraped the magnets, collected the materials. This is how the sled uh, worked. And uh, from a camera that was above it, uh, it was basically like mowing the lawn, you know, just going across, except it was collecting magnetic particles, droplets, uh, that melted off the object, the meteor, when uh, it exploded. And uh, what we ended up fi finding is uh, those uh, spherules that looked very distinct from the background sand, and we collected them with tweezers. We found 850 of them. 
Uh, and I got them uh, by, delivered by FedEx uh, to my home after our return in, uh, at the end of June. And here are some images from the past week uh, of some of those spherules. Uh, some of them um, look like a soccer ball. Uh, and others are, have more complex uh, structure. And we found uh, a unique type of spherules that was never identified before in terms of their composition. So that was in the laboratory of Stein Jacobson, a professor at Harvard, the renowned uh, as one of the world's uh, preeminent uh, geochemists. And on my other side uh, is Sophie Bergstrom, who was a summer intern here. And she actually found most of the spherules. Um, and uh, I g gave her the honorary title, the Spheral Hunter, as a result. Uh, and we found a special type of spherules. The, uh, here we see the abundance of elements, 60 of them, in the periodic table in some of the spherules that showed an enhancement by factors of up to 1,000 of some elements, including uranium, uh, in those special spherules that were found near the meteor path relative to the standard solar composition. So that could be a clue that um, we found materials from outside the solar system. But I will not get into the detail. Oh, there was a claim recently, and a, a lot of people are trying to criticize this uh, expedition without doing any work. They don't have access to the material. So they claim that what we found is actually coal ash. And so here we compare coal ash to the below, to, to this uh, special composition of the spherules that I mentioned. The dif there, there are huge differences by factors of 10 to 100 in some elements. Clearly not coal ash. Once again, science should be driven by evidence, by data, not by opinions. And why would they make an, an, uh, express an opinion when they don't have access to the materials? That I leave for uh, psychologists or social people who study the sociology of science. And we can discuss it if you want. And now we are planning the next expedition. Uh, hopefully, during this year, it will be more expensive. We will look for bigger pieces of the meteor so that we can tell what it was. Uh, and that will cost more money, will take more time, but now we know where to look. So these are the latest updates, and thank you for your time. So we will now, um, I guess, uh, uh, have a brief conversation, asking each other questions so that you can get a better sense about the books uh, that are here, and then, then let the audience, you ask any question you want, OK? Uh, you know, one of the things I, I uh, you know, in the chapter I wrote about you in the book, uh, we talked a lot about your research and how you have critics of your research, some outspoken critics. I think I referred to you as the interstellar Paul Revere in the book. <laughs> the aliens are coming, the aliens are coming. <laughs> You're always quick to point to aliens. And, so, and it reminded me of Albert Einstein because Einstein, we, we know and everyone thinks of him as this beloved person nowadays in 2024, but back in his days he was not you know, it was not universally accepted that he was this beloved scientific figure. Obviously, uh, uh, in the 1930s in Germany, he had a lot of, there was a lot of anti-Semitism against him. But even before that, when he was trying to come up with the theory of relativity, uh, he had detractors. People thought he was crazy. Um, I mean, what are some lessons that you think we've learned from Einstein's days and, and having critics and, and what you're seeing now? Yeah, so in fact, um, what comes to mind is a book that was written a uh, hundred physicists against the theory of relativity. And when Einstein was asked about this book that expressed doubts that theory of relativity is correct, uh, he said, uh, well, if the theory is wrong, you don't need a hundred scientists to make the case. It's sufficient to have one that has a good argument. So what does this teach us? That um, obviously, if people want to use authority to impose an opinion, they need to come together and make a tribe that has more force. I mean, that's what animals do in, the, you know, in, in, in Africa. They, they come in herds because they have more power than their individual abilities to affect things. So, so 
humans, when they want to impose authority, and that happened also during the time of Galileo, and he also said similar things, um, they come together and put pressure on an individual that they either dislike or don't like the views that the individual is advocating. And to me, that's indeed a signature that they don't have a simple argument, because if there was a simple argument, they wouldn't need to come together. A kid could come up with this argument and say the theory of relativity is obviously wrong because of this and that. Why do you need 100 people to say that? Um, and so we now know that Einstein's theory is correct to exquisite precision based on experiments. A lot of people dedicated you know, their career to finding deviations from Einstein's theory, special theory of relativity and general theory of relativity, which is about gravity. They dedicated careers to looking for tiny deviations, haven't found any. Yet, there was this book by a hundred <laughs> people. So I think we, you know, my approach is to follow common sense. And what I sympathize with in, in this context is that common sense is not common. People have an agenda. They have a reason to object to some ideas, either because they are not responsible to these ideas, or because they are attached to past knowledge. And when new knowledge comes in, it threatens their expertise. They were experts in the old knowledge, and someone like Einstein comes forward, you know, that is not uh, from their sort of company of people they know about, and it bothers them. And that, you might think, is a century old notion, but no, I, I can tell you a lot of stories <laughs> from my personal experience over the past year that demonstrate that it might be even stronger nowadays. That scientists who pretend to protect science are actually anti the work of science. They don't want evidence to be shown, to be collected, to be discussed, because they know the answer in advance. And it hurts them if the answer would be different than what they believe in, so they would argue against doing the scientific process of collecting evidence, studying it, and finding whatever we find. Anyway. Yeah, well, uh, Einstein had, Einstein was a very humble person. And I think what you're saying is, I mean, there's a role for humility in science that a lot oh, of people don't have. Oh, a very big role, because yeah. um, the message we get from the universe is stay humble. We thought that we are, everything is about us. And I can understand that because I have two girls, and when they were young, <laughs> they were at home and they thought that the world centers on them. It's basically a reflection of a, a limited amount of information. Uh, you, you know everything that happens around you, and you think that you are at the center. That, that's the first thing to, to imagine. So humanity followed that. You know, Aristotle made it part of his philosophy, and for a thousand years, nobody doubted that. Uh, and then we realized we are not at the center of the universe. And that took some time to adjust, but eventually people adjusted to that notion. Now we know that humans came to exist only a few million years ago, you know, the human species, and we were different from nature. I mean, we were indistinguishable from nature from, nature from most of those few million years, but just recently we started being quite different than nature. And, you know, if you arrive to the cosmic play, late at the end of the play, you know, a few million years is just one part in 10,000 of the age of the universe, and you are not at the center of stage, then the play is not about you. That's obvious. It sounds very reasonable. Any kid can tell you that, right? But nevertheless, if you poll astrophysicists that work on the search for life, they would tell you it makes a lot of sense to spend billions of dollars on the search for primitive life, for microbes, because we are special. And we might be the only ones in the entire universe, and nothing like us exists. That gives us pride. So even though we are not at the center of the universe, we are extremely important. And if we have a visit by anyone else, it will be in order to see what we are doing, because we are very interesting. And I say, forget about this. We are not that interested. 
if they come to visit us, they started the journey long before we became interested, interesting. And they, if they arrive to us before we arrive to them, they are much more advanced than we are. We are completely uninteresting to them. We can benefit by learning from them. Uh, and so a sense of humility is really fundamental in order for us to learn something new that we, you know, about na a neighbor. And obviously you can stay at home and say, I don't have any neighbors. And then close, shut down the windows and say, you know, that's it. But it's irresponsible for a scientist to do that because we want to look through the window and we better use telescopes. And, you know, even the most advanced telescope that will come to operation, the Rubin Observatory, next year in 2025, it will not be able to discover Elon Musk's Tesla in space uh, as a result of the reflection of sunlight from it. It will not be, by orders of magnitude, it will be too faint. So if we cannot see something, the only thing we can see are objects bigger than Starship, this giant, the biggest uh, spacecraft, you know, the biggest uh, rocket that is being built by SpaceX. So just think about it. There could be lots of things floating around us. The biggest telescope we, will, we invested, you know, uh, two-thirds of a billion dollars by the National Science Foundation in, in making this Rubin Observatory in Chile. And even that could not detect what we launch to space most of the time, you know. So, so how can we know that we haven't really searched our vicinity for, you know, anything or any letter in our mailbox, any package in our backyard, nothing. And yet we feel that it's most natural for us to be the only intelligent species that existed since the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. So here is my connection to Einstein. I would say Albert Einstein was probably not the smartest scientist who ever lived since the Big Bang. That's my basic point. Um, and Elon Musk was not the most successful entrepreneur since the Big Bang. And it's our duty to be humble and search for things that are better than us. I think I once heard you say, you have a great metaphor, that we're all actors on a stage. And it's very likely that there were actors on the stage before us, and we should learn what they learned on the right. stage before us. You know, there was a visitor uh, that stood on the street next to my home uh, a year ago, and my wife said, why don't you check, uh, maybe this is a fan of your book. <laughs> You know, he keeps staring at the home for hours. And I went to that guy and I said, who are you? Why are you looking at our home for so long? And he said, uh, I used to live in this home 50 years ago as a kid. And he said, we buried a cat in the backyard called Tiger. And I said, I know this name because I found a stone that had a label on it, Tiger. And I thought maybe it's a tiger buried underneath. Yeah. Who knows? Uh, but this person showed, you know, I showed him the place and oh. he said, yeah, that, that, that's our cat. That's where our wow. cat. And so what this teaches us is that you always have to welcome visitors because they might tell you something new that you don't know from history before you came. So, you know, the solar system existed for 4.6 billion years. Who knows what happened nearby? Right. And if these were around, you know, we should welcome them to tell us the history, the, our cosmic roots, where we came from. We can only learn from that. And yeah. Anyway, we should ask you some questions. Okay. <laughs> um, okay so how how did you first get interested in Einstein? Uh, I, I'm like I, I'm the least uh, likely person to write a book about Einstein. I am not you know not a scientist at all. I knew as much about Einstein as probably most most people in the world. You know, Nobel Prize, theory of relativity, whatever that means the crazy wild white hair that looks like he put his finger in an electrical socket. Uh, that's all I knew. And then I heard this crazy story and it got me just, made me become like an Einstein obsessive. And that's the story of the day Albert Einstein died, uh, April 18th, 1955. He's in Princeton Hospital. The pathologist is performing the autopsy. And when uh, he finishes the autopsy and when nobody's looking, he takes a saw, cracks open Einstein's skull, reaches in, grabs Einstein's brain, and takes it home with him. There is someone, literally, this man stole Albert Einstein's brain. It is the greatest heist of the 20th century. And um, he took it, not because he was, a, maybe he was a crazy guy, but he took it because he's like, here's Albert Einstein's brain, right? The smartest scientist of the 20th century 
It would be a shame not to study this brain. Maybe we could do research and figure out what made him so smart, what made him a genius. And so he kept it. Uh, the problem was he's not a brain researcher. He's a pathologist. He just knows how to perform autopsies. And so he, he put it in a, in a mason jar and brought it home, put it in, on the mantle in the living room where it stayed for years. And his wife was always like, you know, what, honey, could you move Albert Einstein's brain out, off the fireplace? <laughs> and eventually he put it in a beer cooler and put it in his basement. And that's where it stayed for decades lost to history. And eventually, you know, this is before the internet, is 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, he was looking for brain researchers and he just like opened the yellow pages and, you know, looked for brain researchers at different universities. And every, every few years he would cut a little piece of the brain and put it in the mail unsolicited and send pieces of Albert Einstein's brain to researchers all over the world. So pieces of Albert Einstein's brain exist in Honolulu, Buenos Aires, Tokyo. You can actually see a piece of Albert Einstein's brain in Philadelphia. Uh, one of the brain researchers in Philadelphia donated her piece to the Mutter Museum in downtown Philadelphia. And, um, <laughs> and so I heard this story and I was like, wow, when I was growing up, no teacher had ever t told me the story of Albert Einstein's brain being stolen. Many of you look surprised when I just told you the story. And I thought to myself, there must be so many other interesting stories, you know, not scientific, again, I'm not the scientist, I'm, I like to call myself a likable idiot, but, uh, you know, there must be so many more interesting stories, quirky, bizarre stories about Albert Einstein, and that's how I got uh, obsessed, uh, obsessed with him at the beginning, yeah. So a follow-up question, how yeah. did you get the, the job of running uh, Albert Einstein official social media? <laughs> <laughs> so I started, I started writing, I'm a journalist, and I started writing all these different uh, articles about uh, Albert Einstein, um, new things. I started finding out about the brain, and I found, uh, I, I found just all these weird Einstein connections. So there's a guy in Connecticut who has the world's largest collection of celebrity hair. And he, has, uh, he claims to have Albert Ein um, Abraham Lincoln's bloodied hair from the night he was murdered. He has astronaut Neil Armstrong's hair that he bought off of Neil Armstrong's barber. And Neil Armstrong sued him. Anyway, I went to his house, and he, and he holds up a Ziploc bag with white hair, and he goes, this is Albert Einstein's hair. Uh, I don't know if it's true or not. But, so I started writing all these ridiculous stories about Albert Einstein. And one day, the Albert Einstein uh, estate called me up. And I was a little worried, like, why are they calling me? Are they like, please stop writing about the guy who took his brain? I don't know what they were calling me about. But they said, we're very busy. As you know, the archives are academics doing research on Einstein's work. They have 85,000 of his papers. And, and they're like, we actually own the official social media accounts of Albert Einstein, where he has 20 million fans. Einstein has more Facebook fans than, than Tom Hanks. And... Um, and they said, we're too busy doing real science. Would you like to run the social media pages for him? And so that was like uh, six years ago. And so I've been doing it ever since. He's, he's the most active dead celebrity on social media. John Wayne's on, on Twitter, but he doesn't really have much to say. Why, why do you think that is? Uh, that he's so... That he's still so relevant. Uh, yeah, right. Shakespeare doesn't have 20 million fans, right? Uh, Thomas Edison doesn't have 20 million fans. So why does Einstein... That's a great question. Um, I think there's a lot of reasons. I mean, first of all, Einstein came about at the, when all of modern media was just coming into place. Yeah, newspapers, magazines, photographs, radio, television. And he played into it. You know, I don't know if you saw Oppenheimer this past summer. Right? Oppenheimer was a, a very business-like, you know, always wearing a suit and tie, never joking around. Einstein was the exact opposite. He, was, he didn't like to wear fancy clothes. He had holes in his sweater. He didn't like to wear socks. He used to walk around Princeton in his pajamas. I like to call him, you know, like a... Like a like a German Hugh Hefner just walking around Princeton in his bathrobe. And, um, and, and he was very approachable. Kids could come up to him and ask him for help with their homework, and he would help them with their homework. And, you know, the paparazzi would chase him. And he just, he, he connected with people because he was so approachable and he had this grandfatherly look about him. There's this great story, um, Charlie Chap he was friends with Charlie Chaplin, and Charlie Chaplin took Einstein to a Hollywood red carpet premiere. And at the premiere, all the reporters didn't want to interview Chaplin. They wanted to interview Einstein. And, and uh, he, there's another story. He went to Japan in 1922 with his wife. He checks into the hotel, stands outside on the balcony, and there's tens of thousands of people trying to get a glimpse uh, of Albert Einstein. Uh, one funny story about him is he knew what made for a good photograph in the paper. Uh, so any, there's a lot of pictures of Einstein taking his hat and tossing it in the air because he knew that would like, make a really good picture for tomorrow morning's newspaper. And so there's a lot of pictures of him doing it. Right, Marie Curie never did that. 
right? <laughs> now, uh, can you say something about him, uh, Einstein, the hu humanitarian? Yeah, I, I, my, uh, you, maybe you think differently because you're a scientist, but I think Einstein will be remembered in the long run more for being a humanitarian mm -hmm. than, than for being a scientist. I mean, he was very, um, when he immigrated to the United States in 1933, he worked really, he worked tirelessly to help save fellow German Jews uh, from the Holocaust. He, he uh, helped them get visas uh, to, to move to all, part, all across the globe. He started something called the International Rescue Committee which was a refugee aid organization to get uh, German Jews out of Nazi Germany. And that organization, 90 years later, it is still around today. It's one of the largest refugee aid organizations around today. It's Einstein's group. And they're still helping refugees. I interviewed in my book uh, a, Ukrainian, a Ukrainian woman who in February, 22, February 2022, when Russia invaded Ukraine and she needed to get out of Ukraine, Einstein's group helped her escape across the border to Moldova. And she told me, she, that Einstein, she credits Einstein with saving her life, and uh, she said Einstein is an instrument of God, is what, is what she told me. And, and it wasn't just with, so he still, you know, there's the fruit of his labor still happening today. And it wasn't just that uh, refugees, he was very involved in the civil rights movement. Uh, he couldn't believe he had just escaped Nazi Germany, and he saw what happens when you make somebody, when you make a minority the other, and you belittle a minority, and he comes here and he sees what's happening with racism, and he said, he gave a commencement address at a Lincoln University, which was the first college to give co degrees to African-American students. And he spoke at the commencement address. He goes, I will not stand idly by and watch this happen. And he traveled the country with the NAACP, raising money for them. My favorite story about him and the civil rights movement is um, Marian Anderson was a famous African-American opera singer. And she was invited to perform a concert in Princeton. And she gets to Princeton, and she goes to the Nassau Inn, which is the main hotel on the main street there. It's still there today. And she goes to the NASA Inn, and they wouldn't let her check in because it was a, they said it's whites only, you can't check in. Now, I don't know if you've been to Princeton, but the NASA Inn is about a mile away from Einstein's house. Einstein never got his driver's license. He was horrible with directions. <laughs> uh, and so he walked, he, he walked from his house to the NASA Inn and said, Marion, you can come and stay at my place. And they remained lifelong friends until the day Einstein Amazing. died. Yeah. But um, there is another anecdote that I'm not sure you're aware of, but... Uh, Einstein was a pacifist. He yeah. advocated peace. And uh, when the first uh, world war broke, um, he just, you know, couldn't, he dodged the draft. He didn't want to go to, to the war. And uh, Karl Schwarzschild, 40 years old, the uh, director of the Potsdam Observatory at the time, was, uh, you know, he, he felt the duty as, even though he was also Jewish, you know, he felt, um, that he must uh, volunteer to the German military and uh, as a patriot. And uh, within less than a year, uh, he found his death uh, on the uh, front with Russia. With, uh, Russia. And um, he um, managed to write a solution to Einstein's equation called the Schwarzschild solution, which is the first solution of a black hole. But um, he didn't survive much longer to derive even more important results. He died at a young age because he was a patriot. So huh. just to show that in order to get to the full um, uh, uh, realization of your potential as a physicist, you better be a pacifist than uh, a patriot. Right. You know that? <laughs> because Einstein stayed uh, around for much longer and was able to derive important results in physics. So, so uh, yeah. Physics, you know, La was, was, there was a way everyone looked at the universe for hundreds of years, and then Einstein comes around and comes up with all these amazing theories that made us look at the universe differently. Right. Um, and so... But he was... Um, originally, he thought the universe is static because philosophically, it's more appealing to have the universe be there forever and not have a beginning in time like in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. um, and so he tried to find a solution where the universe is not really expanding, but in fact, you know, the force of gravity pulling things together so is being balanced by a repulsive force from the vacuum, which is called the cosmological constant. And so he then realized that, in fact, this is not a valid solution because it's unstable. If you slightly perturb it, you either get collapse or expansion. 
And so he, was, he had the wrong idea about the universe. And um, uh, of course, uh, observational work um, led to the notion of the Big Bang, the fact that there was a beginning in time. We don't know what happened before that. And Einstein's theory breaks down at that point in time of the Big Bang. So we can't really tell what was before the Big Bang. That's actually the first thing I would like to answer if we ever encounter a more advanced scientific civilization. I want to know what happened before the Big Bang. You know? And uh, for, to answer this, you need to unify quantum mechanics and gravity. So we don't have a theory that is predictive. Do, do you think that there will be several hundred years until we'll have the next Einstein? Or do you think that we have we're ripe oh, for another Einstein always, today. I think in every generation, there must be ein people like Einstein. Mm -hmm. The opportunities to make a breakthrough of the type that he made uh, are different and maybe non-existent when you don't have data in some areas of physics or mathematics um, that allow you to, to make the breakthrough. Uh, but he was definitely at the right time coming up with the right ideas. And, an interesting question is whether, without him, the same ideas would come to fruition advo being advocated by other scientists, which mm -hmm. obviously we, we, we will never know. But um, I, I strongly believe, I mean, I see brilliant uh, young people all the time. And many of them are extremely promising, much better than my colleagues that are senior. Uh, <laughs> and uh, then they don't, somehow they do not make it. And you ask yourself, why? And it's a matter of circumstances. you know. You can have an, an exceptional engine, but if you put it, uh, if you uh, if you put that car in a place where it doesn't get much traction, then it wouldn't go very fast. Mm -hmm. So it's I, I believe that uh, people like Einstein exist. In fact, the population is much bigger now, so there should be many of many Einstein. Many Einstein. So if in the in the future, as the population on Earth grows, there should be many more and. Uh, you know, they will appear differently. And, um, but, the, the, you know, I, th I believe that um, a genius has two signatures. One is that you hear about someone's vision or results, and it's just, it, it looks like a leap. It's not something that you can easily understand through um, you know, simple reasoning, but that person had an insight that is a shortcut. So genius is actually being able to make a shortcut, immediately go to the mm -hmm. answer, and it's a revolutionary view of things. That, and so that marker of genius is, I mean, you do see it, but it's very rare. Yeah. Because usually people do incremental steps and just go slowly. Right. Um, and then the second thing is humility, because only when you realize that, you know, uh, there is, that what we know is an island in an ocean of ignorance, only then you are actually able to, to, to be modest and, and, and make progress. Because if you always insist that what we know is everything that can be known, that, you know, physics ended, and, and some people advocated that recently, that we are almost at the end of, mm -hmm. you know, that obvious, you know, then you can be proud of yourself, but you will not make any breakthroughs at that point. Yeah. yeah. You want to open it up? Yeah, let's. Um, uh, the questions? Any questions? Please. Uh, um, so, uh, when you said the idea of. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, um, so we said um, the idea of people who aren't willing to accept things. This may be controversial, but I have to ask it. What do you think the role is of, of faith or in, in, or in organized religious stories and how that fits in with, with stories that you're seeing as far as the, the length and breadth of history and our small piece of it? So you're talking about faith. Uh, yeah. Faith so, and religion. And, uh, yes. I, yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, the, spirituality deals with the unknown, just like the frontiers of science, where you don't know the answer. And therefore, it has something common in, in, in the spirit of exploration that is similar to what artists do, to what sci scientists do when they explore new territories, things that are unknown. Uh, my personal uh, vision is that 
we will be able to unite religion and science uh, because religion is about a uh, superhuman entity. You know, for example, in the Old Testament, Moses looks at the burning bush that was never consumed. And that miracle convinces Moses that there is a superhuman entity. If I was standing next to Moses, I would use infrared sensors that we have <laughs> at the Galileo Project to measure the temperature of this bush, burning bush, and tell how much energy is emitted period of time and try to figure out if indeed it's not a natural object. Uh, because nowadays you can buy you know, on Amazon uh, something that would have looked mirac miraculous to Moses, right? Mm -hmm. So if you think about a very advanced technological civilization, uh, it's a good approximation to God because, you know, it's just like a cave dweller finding a cell phone or looking at the lights of New York City and being amazed, uh, filled with religious awe. Uh, so if we find something that is far more advanced than we are, you know, it, it will bring uh, a sense of uh, religion into science because it will take us a while to figure out what it means. And that's, to me, a path forward at, at bringing people together because one way to unite people is by them accepting that their ego is not the most important thing. So religions used that um, by advocating God, so that unified the community of believers. And if we find evidence, real physical evidence, that something in reality in the universe is far more advanced than we are, I hope it will unite us. It's sort of, you know, the Orthodox Jewish community in, in New York City believes that the Messiah will come from Brooklyn. Right. Uh, it, uh, for me, it's more likely that the Messiah will come from another planet <laughs> far away because, um, you know, it will bring this uh, message that could potentially bring peace to Earth, that here there is something far, the superhuman that we can learn from. Um, and maybe we learn that our universe was created in a laboratory of, uh, by a scientist in a white coat <laughs> that understood quantum gravity and created a baby universe. You know, that's possible. I guess it's good money. <laughs> Any other questions? Over there. So on your next expedition, you're going to look for whether it's larger pieces and are they natural or are they technological. If they're technological, how long would it have taken for it to actually arrive to Earth? That we can, uh, we can tell how long it took uh, by uh, dating the object. So um, there are natural clocks uh, that are b based on isotopes. For example, uranium-238 has a half-life that is comparable to the age of the solar system. So we can uh, date the material and say how long it took it from the time it was made to the time that it arrived to us. And since we know the velocity of the object, the velocity times this time tells you the distance. Okay. And so that's, you know, I thought about this on the, on the ship when we went to the expedition, this is the first time that we will be able to tell where something came, knowing the velocity and the time that it took is, it to reach us. Um, the question I asked my students in the class uh, before I went to the expedition was, if we find a gadget and it has buttons on it, should we press a button? <laughs> <laughs> and half of the students in the class said, please, don't do that. It will affect all of us. We are worried. Don't, <laughs> don't press any button. And then the other half said, uh, please do, because it might be chat GPT 100. You know, it, um, and then one student raised his hand and said, well, Professor Lowe, what would you actually do given the split vote? And uh, I said, well, I would take it to a laboratory and examine it before engaging with it. So you don't need to worry. Right. But I promised Paula Antonelli, the curator of the Museum of Modern Art, that I'll bring it for display <laughs> uh, if we find anything. Because she has this vision, she said at the dinner that I attended a couple of months ago, she said, um, my vision is love the alien. And what she meant is that 
we should, and, and this is an important lesson for Harvard University, we should respect those who disagree with us. Those that are different than us, what she called the aliens, we should love them. Try to understand where they come from. And by the way, that's the mission of an academic institution like Harvard University, to relieve the tension that exists within society. The way I phrase it as a physicist is that Republicans and Democrats are, can equally well discover the laws of physics, the laws of nature. It doesn't matter what your politics. So therefore, politics should be left out of the gate of campuses so that we can bring the best talent and not pretend that the best talent must believe in a particular political agenda. Okay, that's my view and I express, I mean, if you want uh, to read more about the latest uh, work that I do, but also about my view about what the turmoil at Harvard, just check medium.com, Avi Loeb at medium.com, you can subscribe to my essays. Every day or two I write something and I said that there. So my hope is that Harvard will receive the feedback that Washington DC and the general public gave it in recent weeks and months, rather than argue, oh, that it's the right wing attacking us, the right, the, the one part of the political spectrum attacking us, because we want everyone to be engaged in scholarship. We cannot alienate half of the society. Quick follow-up. The little pieces that you found, why can't you do that with them? Oh, they're too small and they were melted off the object. They were less than a millimeter in size, uh, the size of a grain of sand. So actually, we took some pictures. They looked b beautiful and uh, I posted it on medium.com. So my daughter saw, saw it and she said, Dad, can you put one, uh, thread one on a necklace for me? And I said, well, they're made of iron and they are less than a millimeter, you know, they're tiny. Uh, and these were molten, melt, they melted off the surface of the object. So there were elements that are volatile that evaporated during this melting process. And we lost them. So you don't really see all the elements that the object was made of. So if we find a big piece that didn't really melt, that because it was preserved, you know, like the core of the object, just if the boundary melted off but the core remained, um, and it's somewhere, you know, in pieces on the ocean floor, then we can learn about the structure of the object and also about its composition much better. And, you know, even if we find it that it was a rock, uh, and I wrote a paper about that as well, uh, the press is not so interested in that and the, you know, but uh, even if we find a rock, it's the first time that we put our hands on a big object that came from outside the solar system, so that's historic. They, they look like golf balls on the pictures, but you're saying they're really sm much, much smaller. Well, there were some particles that we found, but we think they are human-made, so uh -huh. we didn't. Uh -huh. But yeah, the, the tiny spheres that I showed, yeah. images, they were, these were images by an electron microscope uh -huh. or microprobe that, uh, you know, make it, make, make it look right. big, but, but it's actually less than a millimeter in size. So it's wow. really tiny, a grain of sand the type of wow. size, even the biggest ones that we found. So, wow. so it's, these are small spherules, um, but we want to find bigger ones. So it will require different machinery. We, it will require a, a video feed so that we can see what we are picking up, stronger magnets. So uh, it will cost more money, but we hope to do that. You're getting a lot of frequent fire miles. <laughs> uh, no, actually, we went there uh, on a private jet. Oh, okay. <laughs> Any other uh, questions? Um, Wait. We're, there we go. It's on YouTube, so I think that's why they need the microphone. Yes. <laughs> Physics has uh, come a long way since Einstein. We've advanced our understanding in a lot of ways. Do you think that makes it harder for there ever to be another Einstein-like person because they, you have to know so much more? 
that no. you couldn't make such a dramatic impact? Okay, so here I'll say something that I just wrote an essay about, but I didn't post it yet because we had to come here. <laughs> so, so in the minutes preceding. Um, you see, there, a, a lot of the people that I met over the past 40 years by being a practicing scientist, a lot of them are doing the work not for its own sake of understanding nature, but as a tool to demonstrate that they are smarter than other people so that they get honors and awards. There are lots of scientists like that. And you see that by the work that they are doing. So it could be intellectual gymnastics, like equivalent, in my opinion, to the question of how many angels can dance on the tip of a, a pin, okay? Which is an interesting question. Let's talk about it. Let's write equations. And we can all feel sophisticated. Um, you can talk about extra dimensions. You can talk about the multiverse. Things that in your lifetime might not be tested, okay? But they serve an important purpose of you developing very fancy math that demonstrate that you are smart. Now, you might say, well, that's good because they make progress in mathematics. And, but if you want to learn about the physical world, you have to put your ideas under the guillotine of experiments. And quite often, you might learn that you're wrong. And you know, I learned that through several examples where I was wrong. Now, I found that to be actually a very positive experience because it's nature's way of telling you that you're missing something important. So you're learning something new. If you, everything you expect happens to be realized in nature, it's boring, right? So it's a learning experience, like a detective story. And if the, there is a twist in the conclusions, it actually ma makes it more intriguing. So, so being attached to your ego, you know, I once asked my group of students, I said, what, make, what makes a theoretical physicist happy? And there was silence in the room. And then I said, I gave the answer. I said, lack of data. Because then you can continue to argue that uh, <laughs> your ideas are right and continue to get uh, honors and awards. So it's really you know, um, maintaining your modest humility you know, and, and willing to test your ideas that makes physics fun and worthwhile. And so I'm saying all of that in order to, to converge to the following answer to your question, which is, that nature is under no obligation to make you look smart, OK? So Einstein was successful because you know, he came up with the mathematics that happens to explain how the universe expands, you know, how black holes behave. And you know, so it was a combination of theoretical thinking at the highest levels confirmed by experiments. But let's say we go to the Pacific Ocean and find a piece of a spacecraft that was launched by an extraterrestrial civilization. Let's, let's imagine that. You don't need any fancy math. You just find it on the ocean floor and realize it's not human made. OK? So that would have actually much more impact on the future of humanity, finding something like that, then coming up with very detailed, sophisticated mathematical formulations of the multiverse that we will never visit. OK, you will be very proud of developing that math. And I'm saying that on behalf of hundreds of theoretical physicists who are doing mathematical gymnastics. But it's implications for the rest of the earthlings, the, huma the humans on Earth, will be minimal, even though you are proud of yourself. So my answer to your point is there are still a lot of things for us to discover that would be far more important than anything done before. For me, one of the biggest questions is, are we alone? And of course, there are other issues. Uh, involving the long-term survival of humanity, you know, and so, so there are some major things. And we, you know, we tend to think in terms of what was already found. And so you say, wow, that's amazing that scientists did this and that. 
But just think about the biggest questions that we have no answer to as of yet. What is most of the matter in the universe? It could be surprising. Maybe there is no more matter. It's just gravity that we don't understand. That Einstein gave us the tool, but, but, but it's not the right tools, OK? Uh, what happened before the Big Bang? You know, that's unifying quantum mechanics and gravity. We don't have that predictive theory. There are people working on it for decades. But they cannot, if you ask them what happened before the Big Bang, they say, it's too complicated. We can't tell you. What happens inside the black hole? It's too complicated. We can't tell you. It's just like a plumber coming to your home. You say, can you fix the toilet? And the plumber says, it's too complicated. I can't help you. <laughs> but, you know, the plumber may say, okay, but if you put goggles on your head and live in the metaverse, then there I'm the best plumber in town. That would not be convincing, right? So you want results in the physical reality that we can probe, that we can test, not promises that you, there might be a solution in a place that you can never visit physically. And you're saying that's what Einstein represented? Einstein represents this unique uh, combination of a new vision about physics. Right. And by the way, I should say that there was um, uh, a very famous physicist named Michelson. Uh, who gave a speech at the end of the 19th century, uh, about uh, 1892 or so, at the University of Chicago when they uh, inaugurated the center there. And he basically said the only thing that, I mean, physics is almost complete. And the only thing that remains is to measure fundamental constants to the fifth decimal point. Okay? And a decade later, Einstein came up with special relativity that changes our concept about you know, um, space and time, and then with theory of gravity, and then with the, then quantum mechanics, and so forth. So physics was revolutionized after Michelson. And Michelson was a distinguished physicist expressing his vision. There was actually the director of the Harvard College Observatory. We're now at the Harvard College Observatory. The director of that, Pickering, was arguing that there is no need for a telescope, and that was a century ago, there is no need for a telescope bigger than the size of a person because we pretty much know what the sun looks like, we, uh, the other stars are just like the sun, we will not learn anything new by building a bigger right. telescope. And as a result of that, the center of gravity of observation astronomy moved when, uh, to, to the west coast where uh, the Mount Wilson Observatory allowed Hubble to conclude the universe is expanding. And, you know, so the history of science keeps telling us that when you think that everything is over, there will not be something amazing will, could happen. And so the only thing that can suppress it is the loss of curiosity, the ridicule of different opinions that try to open up new territories for knowledge. So in a way, social media is very harmful to science because you find superficial opinions of scientists that you know, congregate into tribes and ridicule other ideas there. And you know, that's the, the biggest danger to society, not only to science, that tribalism and hate towards me members of other tribes. That's what would kill the American society, you know, and obviously will affect us in, in this election year, you know. I know. We're running short on time. There's food, by the way. Uh, feel free to, and then we'll sign some books. I just want to end. I'll tell you, my, my favorite Einstein quote is, um, I have no special talent. I am only passionately curious. Right, you look at that first sentence, I have no special talent. Albert Einstein, of all people, has every right to say he has special talent. I mean, imagine if all of the Elon Musks and the tech entrepreneurs and the politicians who think they're so high and mighty, imagine if they had some of that uh, humbleness that Einstein had. He goes, I have no special talent. Like, they would never say that. And then the other sentence is, uh, the second sentence is, um, I am only passionately curious. Right? I mean, that goes, speaks to Einstein's humanitarian, you know, not only his scientific degree, but his what does it mean to be humanitarian? It means to care about someone outside of yourself. So when I meet you in the street, instead of saying, let me tell you about me, 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 here's what I did today, I'm just like, tell me your story. Tell me about you. Tell me your struggle. I want to learn about you. That's being curious. And not just curious, be passionately curious. So I think two of the biggest lessons I've learned about Einstein from studying him for uh, the last four or five years is, you know, have bold humility and always be passionately curious. Yeah. Yeah, that's very inspiring.
So we'll be delighted to sign any books uh, that any of you might be interested in. And there is some refreshment and food over there. And, uh, so feel free to mingle, and uh, we'll be glad to speak with any of you. Thank you. Fascinating. I mean, intriguing. So I was looking at those on the words, and I was thinking, those look, and you mentioned um, uranium, but like, fuel, fuel, or is it possible oh. to allow you to go to the main? That's a good question. Yeah. You know but I mean? there are other elements to it.